Good morning, everyone, and um, we're very excited to have this discussion. <clears throat> I requested uh, Kritika and others uh, to give us an hour. I think uh, with great difficulty, they gave us 30 minutes. Thankful for that. So we all know that uh, enterprise has gone through digital transformation. All of us have witnessed how technology has kind of uh, taken over enterprise. We do see very, very clearly industry is, is going to follow the enterprise route. You're going to see the factories of the future or digital industry that's going to happen, that's happening now, and that'll happen even faster, you know, in the future. So with me, you know, we have a deep tech VC. Gani needs no introduction. Uh, and we have two uh, entrepreneurs building technologies to kind of empower industries in their digital transformation. I'll let each of the panelists quickly introduce themselves. Uh, so I'm Satish. I work for India Partners. Uh, Deep Tech is one of our big focus areas. Companies like Sigtuple, Perceptine, Blue Jay, you know, which is a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. Bunch of these are part of our portfolio. Saurabh? Yeah, uh, my name is Saurabh. I run Ati Motors. We make autonomous robots for factories. So been doing this for seven years. Uh, and, and our robots are running across uh, US, India, Southeast Asia. So Gani, uh, we just launched uh, a deep tech venture fund called Yali Capital. Our focus is on several areas, certainly including uh, the factories for the next uh, uh, era. Uh, this is Ravi Teja. Uh, I uh, co-founder and CEO at Perceptine Robots. We are an AI-driven robotic, uh, uh, robotic robots manufacturer for product assembly and packing. Great. Um, so if you really look at what's happening within the factories of future, we all know the applications of AI, uh, whether it's in terms of predictive maintenance, optimization, automation, there's a huge opportunity even to build the industrial LLMs uh, for a country like ours. Second thing is um, industrial IoT, you know, so the kind of data exchange between the machines, the sensors, and the systems for real-time data. Third is, of course, robotics for smart manufacturing as well as productivity. Last but not the least is uh, AR, VR, XR for simulations, maintenance, and even learning. I think in this, we're going to spend more time digging deeper into one aspect. You know, there are other companies like Uptime AI and Haber who I wanted on this panel uh, the founders are traveling. I think uh, both of them are abroad uh, chasing customers, which is more important than any attending a conference. Um, so I think with that, maybe Saurabh, why don't you talk to us about a little bit about your journey and what Ati Motors. I think it was interesting while we were debriefing, you know, having coffee. Ravi brought this up. He said, uh, you know, to simplify, Perceptine builds the upper body and then Ati Motors builds the lower body, you know, within robotics. So I want Saurabh to talk about Ati Motors and... Uh... Yeah, yeah. And, and, and briefly, obviously, in the context of, of the factory of the future, I can, I can start with basically, I think, the two macro trends which are driving the factory of the future. Uh, first is, which is almost all over the place in the world, is people no longer want to do these dull, dirty, dangerous tasks, right? I mean, that is a... I mean, it's a... It's a misperception uh, that in India people will still want to do it for long periods of time, etc. Even when people do it, uh, they, their heart is not in it, uh, attrition is high, uh, because of which you have safety issues, reliability issues, productivity issues, etc. So people are forced to innovate, frankly. I mean, there's just no way around it. It doesn't matter what your cost structure as a manufacturing entity is, uh, just the way the culture has shifted and moved. And in Western countries, there are no people itself. Right, okay, so I mean, there the problem is completely different. There also this whole underlying thing is there, but there's just no young people uh, anymore to do these uh, these jobs. So I think, but but it's a universal phenomenon. It's important to realize it's not only the West's problem uh, that there are no people available to do things. The other part is I think the consumer choice, etc., that we are we enjoy as consumers and love it. The impact of that in factories is that lot sizes are very small. Things change very fast. So the factory of the future basically is going to give you the same kind of cost advantages, but with the flexibility and small lot size. And that's not a simple thing. Factories are known for doing one thing 
uh, in large volume, very fast, very cheap. Uh, but the factory of the future will do lots of things dynamically, production plan change, and change is very difficult. Factories are very rigid, very static. All the systems in the factory are very rigid, very static. Even if people like me, Ravi, build these interesting robotic things which are very dynamic, the other systems are not, right? So the whole software-defined manufacturing is, I think, where the future is going to be. And, and it's a very exciting time for India. We are good with software. We have to understand how this marries with the deeper manufacturing processes, et cetera. And, and we are learning that, right? I mean, although our robots are running in, in the best brands in the world in, in across, across places, but we are learning these deeper challenges that these factories are facing. So, uh, Gani, I mean, uh, you, you're a deep tech VC and you have a bunch of portfolio companies. Gani invested in Idea Forge, I think played a very active role in success of that company. He was also in Tonbo Imaging. Uh, we happen to be partners in the journey at Perceptine. Why don't you talk about your lens as a deep tech VC about, in general, the deep, deep tech startup ecosystem out there, and most importantly, about the digital industry part? Yeah, so uh, we just launched uh, Yali Capital. It's a $100 million uh, deep tech fund. And uh, we focus on six verticals. And one of the main vertical that we believe strongly uh, which will happen in uh, India, surely globally, is smart manufacturing. So smart factoring is one of the six verticals we have decided to focus. And, you know, we, I mean, without any doubt, we can say that India is going to be a very strong player in robotics. You know, we just discussed uh, previously that the way in which in payment, in fintech, India essentially bypassed credit cards, right? We directly went from cash to uh, digital. It's exactly the same thing I expect to happen in Factrix. We will go from humans to complete autonomy. And uh, you know, my, my belief in uh, robotics in India, it happened in, right from school. You know, I, I mean, I'm coming from, I come from NIT Trichy. In 1987, we won the Vincent Bentix Award from IEEE, where in 1987, our classmates could build a robot which could do whitewashing. So, you know, that the belief of that we could fundamentally build good robots in India is proven by companies like Ati Motors, Perceptine, Idea Forge, which also showed that, you know, apart from building, we can also monetize. It's very important in deep tech, you build and you take it all the way till the exit. That's one point. And second point is, without any doubt, we believe that this decade is India's uh, deep tech decade. Uh, you know, Israel, you know, is a startup nation fundamentally have built strong deep tech companies, expect a lot of deep tech companies to come from India. And again, I continue to insist that already some examples have come out, uh, which can go all the way till IPO, and we expect more to happen in, uh, in this decade. Third is, you know, India has got brownfield, greenfield factories, etc. And if we can build a very successful model in Indian greenfield factories, including brownfield, fine, we can easily take that model outside of India. You know that now the world flat, all the theories is going behind, right? The US wants to have manufacturing, Europe wants to have manufacturing, and if you look at semiconductor fab, it's almost, all, almost everything is robots. So you will see that advanced manufacturing should have a lot of autonomy, robots and factory automation, as Satish was telling, with IoT sensors, AI, all are going to be a crucial piece. India will start its journey in India, and once we comfortably prove that model in India, it's going to be exported to the rest of the world. Yeah. No, I think, um, you know, just recapping what Saurabh said, um, please remember software-defined manufacturing. I think it's just kind of that meta OS that you need to build for factories to run is going to be very, very valuable. From Gani's viewpoint, I think it's talking about late adopters leapfrog. I think the cost of technology comes down significantly. Technology becomes a commodity over a period of time. The other piece is, I think it's time for, you know, deep tech startups, right? I think one of the key things post COVID and with the new geopolitical situation out there, uh, the local sourcing has become very, very active and nations want to have business continuity plans they want to be self-sufficient, and hence they are looking at local solutions. So for many of the entrepreneurs out there, you know, this is a great opportunity. The timing couldn't be better. And very importantly, I think now you do see risk capital also being available. 
coming to Ravi, you know, want you to spend some time on how did you zero in on this idea and, uh, you know, your, your journey in terms of why are you excited about solving this problem and uh, your journey thus far? Sure, sure, Satish. Uh, in fact, the, the right context has been said by Saurabh, software-defined manufacturing, right? Um, so I want to give a small story here. Like by, this was in 2009-10 when I was still studying at IIT Madras. I was interning with a company. They were making uh, vending machines, right? Uh, the, what, what I really, you know, s struck me there is the amount of effort that it takes into just doing this simple task of, you know, pushing a commodity to the front. A mechanism or some sort of setup and, you know, parameters which work for lace packet doesn't work that well for a tater pack. Something that works for both doesn't work for a biscuit packet, right? So that really got me thinking, like, you know, if it's so hard and if there is so much of rigid automation that's going into a very simple task of pushing something forward, there ought to be a better way. There ought to be a more scalable way. That's when I, you know, sort of started thinking, like, what if there was a minion? What if there was a robotic arm with computer vision and AI really sitting in that vending machine, which can actually not only just push, but probably just cut open the box and, you know, serve what you want. Isn't that a much more scalable way of building this system? It can not only do vending machine, it can do other things, it can do, you know, n number of things. So really the complexity gets pushed to software and that idea struck me for over a decade and a half now, right? And that's sort of like the early genesis of, you know, Percept Time. And interestingly, factories today are still very rigid. Right? In some cases, high rigidity helps, like extremely high volume manufacturing, like your pharma production packing, uh, you know, FMCG packing, milk packet packing, etc. So that's where, you know, extremely high volume simple products, end-to-end -end automation makes sense, is already there. However, there is a whole lot of other products which we use, which are moderately complex, high mix, like Saurabh is mentioning, consumers want more and more different varieties, Low and very complex, right? Think of your cell phones, your printers, your laptops, your Wi-Fi routers, your automotive headlights, automotive steering, automotive infotainment system, brake subassembly, aerospace subassemblies, and even today, a lot of these are dependent on manual effort. We tend to think probably there is a line on which everything, you know, is just robotized. It's not. It's just people using their eyes and hands to, you know, put together things dexterously, make connections, insert boards, press fit connectors, etc. right? And to me, that is a huge potential and, you know, large problem to solve towards a factory of the future, right? So a factory of the future where robots can not just do dumb pick and place, but rather be intelligent, you know, in picking up objects like we humans do, putting them together, and then, you know, putting the finished product out. So that's, that's the context, and that I think would be a good future. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing to an earlier comment you were making on uh, the geopolitical situation, and, and China plus one is a buzzword in our industry. But I think it's not only about local sourcing. I think the world is looking for India for options, right? Because suddenly a huge thing has, uh, I mean, there's a huge vacuum because uh, China was a big name in manufacturing, and that supply is suspect now, right, for the whole world. And, and the whole Western world lo is looking for an alternate, and I think India is the only potential option, and we are not giving enough options today, right? A huge vacuum, huge opportunity for Indian companies to think beyond just local for India. I don't think it is only about local for India. We should think bigger, and we can do it for the rest of the world also, right? So there's a huge uh, opportunity which sometimes we are undershooting for. No, I think that's a very good point, um, but um, I always believe, I think from a VC lens, Ghani can chime in here as well, that you need to first build the product, mature the product, and then be able to go out there and compete on a global platform, right? You only have one shot. If you fail, you're never going to get, right? So I think it's very important for entrepreneurs to be ready. It's very easy to sit here and imagine that I can sell in US, but what's your right to win in US or Europe is something you need to understand very, very well, right? The whole product lifecycle management. One more thing, I think from, you know, when you look at building deep tech products or building even products within the industrial vertical, I think domain expertise becomes extremely important. 
So you're looking at people who have spent tens of years, uh, you know, building world-class products and going through product lifecycle management, and hence they also understand customer requirements and competitive offerings in the industry out there. So they're able to kind of build these and take to the next level. Now I want to move to the other interesting topic you talked about. I think a lot of times when we're building these products, right, so how have you folks approached this from an IP perspective? What's your tech mode? What's your defensibility? What portion of stuff, you know, is from bill of materials from here through indigenization as opposed to importing them and assembling them? If you want to spend some time talking about it, that would be very relevant. Right. I, I think the opportunity is to, I mean, like what Ravi was describing in detail, which was good, right? I think it's a case study on how you look at the problem and then think from first principles on how we need to solve it with the modern software first lens, right? So hardware is an important part of it, but the lens becomes software first. And then you are no longer thinking as in, oh, I'm just making it in India. Uh, you have to design in India. Frankly, you can make it anywhere in the world, right? I mean, that's not the actual edge that manufacturing in India is cheaper. The fact that you have designed it ground up to be better and for the modern world. We should no longer think that, no, okay, this was expensive in the US, I'll make the same thing cheaper in India. Making the same thing is not a startup's journey, right? I mean, that's for big guys to do, et cetera, that they'll take something, technology import, import it from outside and make it cheaper. We have the opportunity to be part of a disruptive thing, make it from the first day itself in a new mode, in a, with a new lens, and then the parts change. It's no, now we are no longer thinking about is the part cheaper there or here? We may have to develop the parts. And, and for example, uh, I mean, Ravi is designing sensors on his own because he has to, right? And, and we had to design motors. I'm very proud of saying, right? I mean, the robots that run, say, in the US factory is running a Coimbatore motor, okay? It's not a Chinese motor that I'm running, right? And it's the same robot. It's not like for US, we need a different robot. For India, I need a different robot. Why? We made a robot for India which outperforms every robot in the world. And that's how we have to think about, I mean, Ankit earlier mentioned the same thing for Idea Forge, and India presents very unique and hard problems for all of us. If we solve them, we should not be, especially in manufacturing, all the factories in the world, I mean, we have seen US factories are sometimes worse than Indian factories I've seen, okay? I mean, the Bosch, TVS factories in Bangalore are way better than many of the factories in Midwest, okay? So we should not think that there is some very fancy stuff happening in Japan and US and we are way behind. If our stuff works in Indian factories, it is already there for the best of the world. No, those are great insights. Go ahead, Ravi. Yeah. Uh, I very much uh, agree, Saurabh. In fact, uh, one, one more perspective to think about it is adding to what Ankit said in the you know, panel in the morning, which is, you know, how many levels of depth, you know, in terms of, like, you know, in your tech stack, you know, how deep is your, you know, vertical integration, right? Uh, it's not mainly for cost, actually. In fact, if you buy an IC or a microcontroller, whether you're in India or in the US, it costs about the same. So that's not the key difference. The key difference really is the control that you get over the performance and the customization that you can do, including the cost, basically. So that's the most important advantage of being able to, you know, vertically integrate. And one key metric that I, you know, suggest, like, uh, you know, to think about is Let's say I'm putting a system together. Are the components that are going into the system generic components or are they very specifically designed for that particular application? If they're designed very much for that application, then I think we can drill down a little further and see about the vertical integration. But if it is something which are generic components, if those components, I think that's a good amount of vertical integration for a company to be in, to get the highest amount of control on the design. Gani, you know, want your perspectives uh, on um, what is the lens that you use when you're evaluating such entrepreneurs who are coming and presenting to you? What is the kind of diligence you go through before you say, I'm ready to give them a term sheet or I'm ready to engage deeply with them? That's true. So be before that, Satish, you touched on the IPR strategy on the previous question. I just want to add, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs in this uh, 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 audience please pay attention to the IPR strategy, right? I mean, many of us are not patenting enough. It's very important to patent. You know, patent belongs to two classes, right? Defensive and offensive patents. As a startup, we don't have time to go after someone, but we need to have sufficient ammunition in ours when we need to defend. So please make sure 
Idea Forge is an excellent example. You know, they didn't have any several years back, and today, I'm sure Ankit would have probably mentioned, he has 74 patents today. Right, and yet another company I spoke yesterday still have no plans for patenting. Already raised close to 160 crores or so. So it's very key for all the entrepreneurs to have an IPR strategy, work with the lawyers, think what you have to patent. If you want to create a globally innovative company, an innovative company from here which is going to go scale, you have to have patents in your portfolio. That's one. In terms of uh, the Satish, your question, you know, first is I look for uh, excellent co-investor like you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, you would have done half the job of meeting the entrepreneurs. But see, the way in which I look at this, it's deep tech or non-deep tech, it's two things we look, right? One is, we personally look at a company where it's not a superstar, but it's a galaxy. You know, there is a set of superstars in the team. You know, we need to have three to four founders, each with diverse, diversified skill set, right? One in marketing, one in tech, even in tech, one in software, one in hardware, and one probably in business. A galaxy is something which is very key to me. Second is large market opportunity, right? I mean, if you look at any opportunity, if, you know, let's say for argument's sake, you know, the simplest example is if somebody is building a heater to be, built, to be sold in Chennai, I mean, that's a very long, small, uh, uh, you know, room heater, I'm saying. This is an extraordinarily small market. So you need to have a very large market, exceptional founding team, who are flexible, because all startups are going to go ups and downs, all plans will change. They just have the flexibility and agility to change. Uh, but by the way, let me also tell, uh, you know, in Ati Motors, uh, he's a star, because he's three in one. So he has combined all the three founders into one. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Saurabh, um, one of the biggest challenges for most of the deep tech entrepreneurs is the go-to-market and finding customers. And you've been successful in getting some customer traction, not just in India, even abroad. Do you want to quickly share? Because we've all said we'll leave five minutes open for Q&A. So I know we have only two minutes left. Yes. So I just want you to quickly chime in on go-to-market. Right. And Ravi, I'm going to come back to you if we're interested. Right. So I think specifically, uh, uh, I think the way we think about go-to-market as a, as a deep tech startup is a little different from other startups, especially with B2B use cases. I think if you go really solve hard problems, the go-to-market becomes easier, okay? Customers are looking and are fed up of not finding anybody who's solving their problem. So it's, it's, it's a little contrary that go-to-market is not the, I mean, you have to be smart about it. It's not like you don't, you know, you need to ignore it, but it is not, as hard as actually solving that hard problem. If you solve the right problem, it's the harder thing is to solve the right problem. Okay, I think the... No, the, I, I yeah. get the product market fit, but what yeah. did you do to get traction? Did you go sell? Did you hire a VP of sales who knew sure. how to sell? Right. Yeah. No, initially, I mean, we kept engaging, but later on, we, we hired a VP of sales very late, uh, frankly. But uh, we hired salespeople who had experience in the domain. I think that was important right. uh, to close deals. People with eight, 10 years experience, especially we are talking about manufacturing. So people who are sold in manufacturing. It's not important. I think some one mistake people do is people try to get people who are sold technology and then say, oh, you can sell in a new vertical. But no, the knowledge of the domain and how to sell to a vertical. So a person who is selling maybe fasteners to a factory can also sell a robot to the factory. That's easier for him to learn because he knows how to sell to this particular audience rather than a person who who's maybe sells soft, who's used to selling software to say uh, retailers or restaurants and if he, he will not know how to get a gate pass into a factory, okay? So, so you, you really need to know how to navigate this environment. You need to know that you need to show up to a factory wearing safety shoes, otherwise you're going to wait uh, two hours. I mean, these things you don't want to learn on the job. Start startups don't have all the, uh, I mean, all the time to learn these things from scratch. So these are things you can borrow from the market. There are a lot of great salespeople, but teach them your product. Don't don't teach them uh, how to sell. I mean, they will teach you how to sell to that market. Yeah. yeah. So quick recap, you know, just uh, definitely uh, first principles thinking from design perspective. IP, including freedom to operate, you know, is very, very important. I think getting the right people, uh, these are going to be very long sales cycles. Getting the right help is going to be very, very important uh, for entrepreneurs out there. So we'll open it up for Q&A and depending on how many questions, you know, we can continue till our... Yeah. Uh, a quick question. Uh, what do you think of India's 
participation in international standard formulations. <clears throat> I see not much happening. And I think that might be a very good strategy for gaining recognition as well as highlighting our products in international markets. I, I have noticed that. I mean, we have sometimes gotten in, in, invited and a lot of new standards are getting created, right? So they, but I, I think right now, Indian startups are still very nascent to participate in standard committees, etc. The kind of bandwidth you need start. We are not as big or mature in the ecosystem today that we have the bandwidth. I think we have the capability. Those guys want us, right? But it's just, it'll happen with time. Unfortunately, it's, it's not, uh, I mean, we are not there yet in terms of just our scale and size and muscle. But that's, that's a great point though. I mean, that's a very good approach in terms of getting, building the brand and eventually also making sure that your product meets the spec. Uh, to be able to get to the velocity. Any, any comment you have? Any thought quickly? Yeah. Uh, in fact, so once we're at the cusp of the technology, you know, for many years together, I think as new and new uh, avenues and new and new areas keep getting created, I think that time will definitely arrive, you know, where we are also at the forefront of making and defining some of those standards. I'll, I'll go further and say that a lot of times what we end up doing is um, we patent those, right? So where we see gaps. But I think you should take the initiative and if there is a particular alliance that does not exist as a startup, even I would put that alliance together and become the thought leader. So to kind of march the entire industry forward. Any other questions? I just want to add one so more as you're yeah. speaking. Yeah. Uh, if you look at 5G and 6G, the way in which China has played the standards game and uh, went ahead is, is an example. India is also doing, but that's an example which we should follow. But as he rightly said, we are a little bit in the early in the deep tech. It will happen. Hope to happen. Okay, uh, thanks, it was a very nice discussion. I just still, uh, you know, like when we talk about connected factory, when we talk about industry 4.0 and all this, I always see after even coming to India, like there is, if you see at, moment, at this moment also, 85% of the great factories in India, we, are, we cannot tell that it's connected factory, right? And when we see this slide also behind you, we are very good and we are definitely very good on resolving things onto the software layer. We have got solid things, AI, ML. We have, you guys are doing so much in robotics and all this. But when we are simply talking about, when you are telling about that vertical approach, like when you go from beyond SCARA, even to the MES layer, we don't have a connected MES in, I think, not more than 5% 5, 5 of the industry. We are talking about AI, AI, ML. There is a group who is very good in softwares. We try to resolve everything on software. But when you talk about domain expertise on the other side, onto the PLC and all this, there are so many companies who are just closed environment. That how with you, I just want to know how are you connecting this ITOT gap? Majority of people doesn't even know what is ITOT. Yeah, right, right. So uh, I would say the opportunity for India would be, as Gani was saying, to leapfrog. I think uh, factories in US now are thinking that these old generation MESs are not going to work, right? And and now. We have the opportunity. The 95% people don't have to change their systems. Now they can adopt newer approaches where all things are, uh, are REST-based APIs. I mean, factories don't understand what is REST-based APIs, okay? Uh, I mean, Tesla has been looking for robots with REST-based APIs. They don't find them. They had to throw away all the MS systems and make their own, right? So, so, so in US, SpaceX, Tesla, et cetera, and, all, and a lot of engineers have left from there doing startups. You see a whole ecosystem in the US trying to make these systems uh, in various places. Uh, so we should not be adopting these late generation Japanese and European technologies. We should join this bandwagon of leapfrogging and joining the future of it. It's not all defined yet, okay? So it's a little harder, it's a little difficult, uh, but that's the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more perspective to also add to what Saurabh is saying is that I think the connection of, you know, various individual agents in a factory cannot always be a very structured, completely screen, streamlined, end-to-end -end connect. There will be different players, they will have different you know, interfaces, they will have everything. And what we really need are agents in place of humans, okay, who are interacting naturally with all of these. Like for example, I have a CNC machine. I cannot have a REST-based API probably for that, right? You have to interact in a way that a human already does. So I think it's a mix of both that we definitely need, you know, some streamlining of API, and definitely we need to just accept all the different, you know, uh, make differences and everything which are there and interact with the machine like a human probably does. Great, I think our time is up. Um, thank you all, let's give them a big round of applause. And